Okay, um, welcome everyone to the 55th meeting of New Directions in Group 2 and Jungle Categories. Today our speaker is Henry Kahn from the University of Copenhagen, and uh, he'll be speaking to us about the Q-shaped direct category of a ring. Great, okay, thank you. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, online seminar, New Directions in Group Theory and Triangulated Categories. Uh, there will not be any uh, groups in my talk, but there will be some triangulated categories, so, so I hope uh, somehow it is within the scope of the seminar. Um, yeah, so, so the title is the Q-shaped derived category of a ring, and um, <clears throat> let's see if I can go down here. And I will be talking about a, uh, a joint paper with Peter Jorgensen uh, from Aarhus University, and it has the exact same uh, title as the talk. And in case you're interested in some of the details, you can find it online. You can also write, write me an email or ask me in the seminar or anything. Um, so let me start by setting up some notation. Uh, so throughout the talk, it will be any ring, any non-commutative ring. Uh, a mod will be the category of uh, left A modules. And C of A will be the category of uh, complexes of A modules. And D of A will be the derived category of uh, A mod. So I'll get back to that in a moment. If you don't know what it is, you probably know, but I want to tell you about some key facts about the derived category, because this is somehow the motivating category for the construction I will talk about today. Uh, yeah, okay. So if, if I had to explain uh, very briefly uh, what the talk is about, uh, which um, I don't know, it, it, it might be useful if you have to, have to leave the talk or you fall asleep or something, uh, it will be the following. So the talk in a nutshell is somehow, it's about a construction which um, takes us input some suitably nice pre-additive category Q and uh, returns as output some triangulated category, which we denote DQ of A. And this is what we call the Q-shaped derived category of the ring A. So you have this uh, family uh, <clears throat> of triangulated categories somehow parameterized by this Q. And uh, the construction is made in such a way that if you specify uh, Q appropriately, then you get out uh, the ordinary uh, derived category of A mod. So somehow it's a, it's a variation or somehow a quantization of, uh, of this uh, usual derived category. Uh, this family of triangulated categories, uh, they enjoy uh, some of the same properties as the derived category. Uh, but uh, maybe I should say already now that um, the, the objects of the derived category is, is complexes of A modules, but the, the objects of these Q-shaped derived categories uh, will be something else. There will be diagrams of other types, um, but basically uh, they somehow resemble uh, the derived category. Okay, so uh, before we make the passage maybe to the Q-shaped derived category, it's useful somehow to uh, recall some basic facts about the usual derived category. Uh, so what is the derived category? <clears throat> it's somehow an example of a uh, localization of a category. So it's a very kind of general notion. You start with some category here called M and some collection of uh, morphisms, uh, usually called weak equivalences. And here I denote them WEC. And then you can uh, make the localization. So you somehow formally invert uh, the weak equivalences in your category M drops in a new category, uh, somehow often denoted like this M weak inverse. And uh, what used to be somehow just weak equivalences in, your, uh, uh, in, in, in the category you started with now become actually isomorphisms uh, on the nose in this category. And, and maybe a little bit more formally, there is a functor from the original category to this localization, which has some sort of uh, expected universal property. And somehow the idea and the motivation behind this localization is of course that um, in, in, in many situations, you're only interested in, in objects or morphism, uh, morphisms up to some naturally occurring notion of weak equivalence. And, and in that case, it's better for you to work in this localized category because here, maybe two objects would used to be just uh, weakly equivalent. Now they become actually isomorphic uh, on the nose. So this is somehow the idea. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and maybe I should say that in, in, in full generality, uh, there is a potential uh, existence problem because this localization 
uh, might not exist, uh, but in, in this talk, it will not be a problem. Okay, um, yeah, so as I said, uh, the derived cate category is an example of such a localization. Uh, quite specifically, you take the category of uh, complexes of A modules, and then you localize uh, with respect to the collection of, uh, of quasi isomorphisms. And, and a quasi isomorphism is simply just a chain map of complexes which uh, induce an isomorphism on the level of cohomology. So this is what it is. And, and again, this, this supports the idea that you basically, you are not maybe so interested in, in complexes themselves. You're more, more interested somehow in their homology. And because of this, it's more natural to work with complexes in the setting of the derived category. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. So, so in many uh, situations of, uh, of interest, uh, your weak equivalences will be part of a so-called uh, model structure. Uh, I don't want to define what it is, but it's a, <clears throat> it's a triple of classes of, uh, of morphisms in your category called co-fibrations, uh, weak equivalences and vibrations, subject to certain uh, axioms, of course. And in this, uh, I mean, if, if you are in this uh, situation, then the localization certainly exists and uh, you have all the tools from uh, model categories available to somehow manipulate and understand this, uh, this localized category. And, uh, and usually in, the, in this setting, the localization here is called the homotopy category of the model category M. And, and usually one writes it like this, ho of M, so this is the notation I will be using. Ho of M is just the localization of, of M with respect to weak equivalences. Okay, <clears throat> so back, back to complexes. Uh, so, so, so the category uh, C of A of complexes of, uh, of A modules, it has sort of two classical model structures. Uh, one is called the projective or the standard model structure. The other is called uh, the injective model structure. And these two model structures are in some sense um, <clears throat> compatible uh, because they have the same weak equivalences. So in both model structures, uh, the weak equivalences will be the quasi isomorphisms. Uh, and therefore these two model structures have the same homotopy category because the, the homotopy category only depends on your weak equivalences. So in that sense, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, in the projective model structure, the vibrations are quite easy to describe. They're simply all subjective chain maps, but the co-vibrations, they are a little bit more tricky. They are uh, only certain injective chain maps. They have to be injective chain maps with a so-called um, semi-projective co-kernel. Uh, yeah, and dually in the injective model structure, uh, the co-vibrations are easily understood. They are all injective chain maps. But the vibrations are more tricky. They are subjective chain maps with a semi-injective kernel. Yeah, and as I said, the derived category can be obtained. One way to say it is that the, der the derived category is the homotopy category of either of these model categories. Uh, if you don't know uh, what a chain, uh, what a semi-projective or semi-injective complex is, it's not uh, very important for the talk, but maybe I will just give you an example to have in mind. Um, so, so if you look at uh, any complex uh, bounded to the right and consisting of projective modules, that will always be a semi-projective complex. So if you go to an unbounded complex of projective modules, it may or may not be uh, semi-projective. So for unbounded complexes, it's a little bit more tricky. But for bounded complexes to the right, you just need a complex consisting of projective modules. Yeah, and dually, uh, if you have a complex which is bounded to the left and consists of injective modules, that will be a typical example of a semi-injective complex. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, so as I said, we, we, we want somehow to, to, to make a variant of the, of the derived category uh, and the objects in the derived category are complexes. So in order somehow to make the passage from the the ordinary derived category to the Q-shaped derived category uh, yet to be explained. Uh, it's, it's useful somehow to think of complexes in a certain way. So how can we think about a complex? Uh, we, we can think about a complex uh, as, a, as a representation of a certain quiver with relations. So here uh, we have the quiver, which I call A double infinity. It has a uh, vertex for every integer and they are connected uh, with arrows like this. And uh, a representation 
yeah, but by the way, when I say representation in this talk, I always mean a representation with values in the category of A modules. So an A module value representation, this will be a representation. So representation of this quiver is, uh, is a diagram of, uh, of, of, of A modules and homomorphisms of this shape. This of course uh, looks like a complex, but in order to actually be a complex, you have to require that the composite of any two consecutive uh, maps uh, should be zero. So therefore you have to introduce the relations uh, delta n, delta n plus one for every n. So in other words, you must require that all paths of length two in this quiver has to be zero. They have to be zero. Okay, but once you impose these relations, representations of this quiver satisfying these relations is nothing but the category of complexes. So, so here we think of the category of complexes as a category of representations of a certain quiver with certain relations. And, and uh, yeah, and as I just uh, said, uh, the, this, this category of representations, this specific category of representations has two sort of canonical model structures, a projective and an injective model structure with the same equivalences and therefore the homotopy category. This is the derived category. Okay, so now you can uh, maybe uh, imagine we can ask, okay, suppose we start with some other quiver gamma equipped with some other relations uh, R and we look at the category of representations of this quiver, again, A module value representations, maybe, maybe not, maybe this uh, abelian category will somehow have two interesting, one or two interesting model structures. And if so, we can then consider the associated homotopy category, which might also be, be interesting. So this is somehow what the, <clears throat> what the talk is about. Uh, and before I go to the sort of mathematical details, I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, specific quivers with relations to have in mind where the answer is actually yes, we can find some interesting model structures. And yes, there is a nice uh, homotopy category, which is worth uh, investigating. Uh, so let me give you some examples. So one, one quiver with relations is this one. This gives you complexes. It has an interesting homotopy category. So here's another example. Uh, so we take uh, the same quiver as before. So a double infinity, so uh, diagrams of this shape, but instead of uh, imposing that the composite of two consecutive maps should be zero, we, 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 we now require that the composite of n consecutive maps should be zero. So, so our relations will be that all paths of length n, where n is some fixed uh, number greater than two, uh, should be zero. So of course the representation of this quiver is again, it's a diagram of the shape, a diagram of a modules of the shape, but now you have the nth power of the differential must be zero. So these uh, gadgets have a name, they're called n complexes. So representations of this quiver with these relations will give you the category of n complexes. And this I denote like this, C n of A. So this is n complexes. So it turns out that, uh, <clears throat> that also for this quiver, there will be actually two interesting uh, different model structures with the same weak equivalences. And therefore you have the, the same homotopy category and this homotopy category of, is yeah, somehow of course, uh, the derived category of N complexes and it has been studied by, by other people. And yeah, I mean, uh, quite a few people have studied N complexes or so I'm, somehow I felt that I needed to give a few references here. It's always a little bit dangerous because once you give a list of references, you also, uh, maybe not, maybe you don't mention all references. So I just want to say, here are some people that have studied N complexes. The list is not complete, but, uh, but at least uh, these are the papers uh, which uh, somehow is, is, is closely related to this work. So they, they go back to Kapanov, as far as I know, from 91. Uh, and more recently, the, the N complexes have been studied by, in papers by Gillespie and Hovey, and also by Yama, Kato and Miyachi. Okay, so here's another example. Um, so sigma L, L is a number uh, greater than or equal to one. So uh, sigma L will denote this cyclic quiver. So it has uh, L vertices and L arrows labeled uh, zero, one, two, and so on, going back to L minus one. Um, 
So, so for example, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three will be those uh, cyclic quivers right there. And the relations I want to impose in this case are also all paths of a fixed length n should be zero. So, so representations of this quiver are, of course, if they are what they are. They are diagrams of this shape uh, subject to this uh, condition here. So this means that uh, the category of representations can be identified with, uh, with L periodic N complexes. So this is my notation, C L per N of A will be L periodic N complexes of A modules. So again, here also here, it turns out that there are two different model structures of interest with the same weak equivalences. And you have an associated homo homotopic category, which one could call the derived category of L periodic uh, N complexes. And maybe I should mention that already uh, the case uh, L equals one, if I take L equal to one, then I'm in the case of this uh, quiver here. And if I take N equal to two, then I get uh, what people usually call differential modules. So it's, it's a module equipped with a single differential. Uh, yeah, so this is a differential module. So, so differential modules are a special case of, of, one, of, of L periodic N complexes. And they too have been studied by, by, by quite a few people. Okay, <clears throat> here's another example. So here is uh, the quiver known as the repetitive quiver of A4. So here is, um, he, he, here's a copy of the quiver known as A4. Here's another copy of the quiver known as A4. And these uh, multiple copies are connected by arrows according to certain rules. And this gives you the repetitive quiver of A4. You can, of course, replace the number four by some other number, but I just wanted to make it concrete. So um, the, the relations under consideration in, in this example are the so-called mesh relations. So it means that every square is anti-commutative. So up down is this uh, plus down up will be zero. And if you are on the upper edge here, then down up is zero. And if you're on the lower edge, then up down will be zero. So these are the mesh relations. Um, and and, and the, I mean, the category of representations of this quiver with these relations, I don't think they have a good name. I haven't seen a name in the literature, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I will call them, I will call them wide or thick complexes because somehow they are uh, thick, wide versions of, of complexes. In fact, if you take, I mean, if you replace four by the number two, then this will be nothing but uh, just ordinary complexes. Okay, but also in this case, uh, there is an interesting homotopy category, there, there are model categories and so on. So maybe just one more quick example before I go to the theory. Um, so here we have the double quiver of AN. So we start with the quiver AN, it's up here. Uh, n vertices in arrows, n minus one arrows, and then you double the quiver by adding an arrow in the other direction for every arrow in the original quiver. And what you impose are again the so-called mesh relations, and uh, it doesn't really matter, but this is also an example which will fit the theory. Representations of this quiver, they are what they are. I don't think they have a good name, but it, it, it is also an example. Right. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, so, so so far I've been talking about uh, quivers with relations, but somehow it's actually a little bit, uh, I mean, conceptually it's a little bit easier and also a little bit better to talk about pre-additive categories. So, so the point is that every quiver with relations gives you a pre-additive category, the path category of your quiver. And, and the point is that representations of uh, the original quiver now corresponds to additive functors on this path category. So here you can see my notation. Uh, if you have some, if you have some small pre-additive category Q, then I write Q comma A mod for the category of additive functors from Q to A modules. So, so this Q, well, what I'm saying is that if you take this Q, to be the path category of some quiver with relations that you start with, then you get back the category of representations. So, so somehow we want to drop the uh, we want to drop the quiver, we want to drop the relations, and just work with these preadditive categories. So this category here, this functor category here, Q comma A mod, this will be the this will be the 
the category in focus from now on. Okay. So, so, uh, <clears throat> so the previous question, or maybe the motivating question, was somehow: suppose we are given some quiver with relations, can we find some interesting model structures on the category representations? This is now replaced by a little bit more general question, namely: suppose that we are given some small pre-additive category Q, consider the functor category the category of additive functions from Q to A modules, can we somehow find some good, interesting, relevant uh, model structures on this category? And remember, we're doing this for any ring. We're doing this for any ring. So uh, somehow, I mean, given just some arbitrary ring, the category of A modules does not necessarily have some interesting model structure. So somehow, these model structures, they will arise from the category Q alone. This is the basic idea. <clears throat> okay. And uh, yeah, as I, I, I will explain to you that in, in some cases, uh, for example, in all the examples I mentioned uh, before, uh, the answer is yes. If Q is nice enough, yes, there will be some interesting model structures. They will have the same weak equivalences so there is an associated homotopy category, which I write like this, the homotopy category of the functor category. And as I said, you basically just invert the weak equivalences, whatever they are. And this is what we call the Q-shaped derived category of, uh, of the ring A. So this is the definition of, uh, of the gadget that appears in the title. <clears throat> yeah, and as already somehow, uh, Gave away from the examples, uh, examples of this construction will give you the derived category, quote unquote, the derived category of uh, N complexes, the derived category of L periodic N complexes, the derived category of wide complexes, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> so now we, we have this functor category Q, comma A mod. So to begin with, Q is any uh, pre additive category. So it's, it's, it's a very, very general category. <laughs> Uh, I will impose some conditions uh, so, soon enough, but uh, basically we start out with any Q and we want somehow to find some good, interesting model structures uh, on this on this functor category. And, and the tool to do this uh, will be this uh, much uh, cited result by Harvey from 2002. So it says the following, you, you start out with some abelian category and, and the abelian category of interest here will be uh, this, uh, this functor category. And then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, what is called abelian model structures on your abelian category M. So this will be uh, model structures in the sense of Quillen, which are suitably compatible with the given abelian structure. And then on the other hand, so-called Harvey triples, I don't want to define what they are, but they are somehow uh, triples uh, CEF of classes of objects in M subject to certain conditions. And somehow this, uh, yeah, this result uh, replaces the search uh, for model structure by the search for a Hovey triple, which to me is a little bit easier. So this is somehow a little bit more algebraic. Uh, so Hovey triples are, from, from my point of view, easier to access, and therefore uh, I like this result here. So actually, it's quite easy to explain how you go to how you go from one to two. So if you're given some uh, abelian model structure on your abelian category M, how do you define a Hovey triple? Well, you said C, E, and F should be the classes of cofibrant, trivial, and fibrant objects in your model structure. So by trivial object, I mean a, a, an object which is weakly equivalent to zero. Okay. <clears throat> So actually there are sort of um, a couple of uh, extreme situations uh, where things become even simpler. So um, an abelian model structure is called projective if it happens that every uh, object is vibrant. So in, 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 in the sense of this Hovey triple, it means that the class F here should be all of M. Such, a, such an abelian model structure is called projective, or sometimes you call the, the associated Hovey triple a projective Hovey triple. And, and dually, uh, an injective model structure is one where all objects are vibrant. So in, 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 in the case of this Hovey triple, it means that this class C should be all of it. 
So, 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 so this is what I mean when I say we're looking for projective and injective model structures. We're looking for uh, model structures where every object is vibrant, respectively co-vibrant. This is what I mean. And this is particularly simple because if you somehow uh, work out the definition, it turns out that in order to give a projective model structure, say, you just have to specify the class E of trivial objects and make sure that it satisfies certain conditions. So this is what I've written here. If you want a projective model structure, what you really want is a class E of objects in M, which will at the end of the day be the class of uh, trivial objects. Uh, and it must satisfy certain uh, conditions. So, so one condition here is easy to explain. E should be thick. And this means that uh, E should be closed on a direct summons. And it also means that uh, if you have a short exact sequence uh, in M, where two of the three terms belong to E, then the third term must also belong to E. This is what it means to be thick. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't want to explain the other two conditions here, but you can see they somehow involve this uh, perpendicular class E left perpendicular. So let me at least uh, explain what I mean by that. So the definition is down here. E left perpendicular, they are all the objects in, in, in your category M, which are somehow left uh, X1 orthogonal to everything in E. So, so X1, X comma E must vanish for all objects in E. This is the definition. Okay, so this somehow, uh, so somehow this makes it clear what the strategy is to achieve our goal. Our goal is to find nice projective and injective model structures on this uh, on this functor category Q comma E mod. So we have to find out uh, how to define a, a sensible notion of, uh, of trivial objects, how to define the class E. And once we have a good definition of E, we must check that E satisfies all these conditions. This is the, this is the plan. Okay, so, so the first question is how to define this class E in a sensible way, or maybe in an interesting way. Uh, and what we do is we, we, we turn to the uh, one situation where we actually are pretty sure of what E should uh, be. So we turn to uh, the case of complexes, and here we know for sure that we want E to be the class of exact complexes. So in this special case, if we specify Q to the quiver with relations I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk, we specify Q to be that quiver, then we know this becomes the category of complexes, C of A, and then we know that E should be the exact complexes. And so by the way, uh, once you know that E should be the exact complexes, it is not so difficult to compute the left perpendicular and the right perpendicular of E. The left perpendicular turns out to be all these semi-projective complexes. The right perpendicular will be all these semi-injective complexes. And once you have this, uh, these expressions for E, E perp, uh, E left perp and E right perp, it is actually pretty easy and, and of course well known that, uh, that this data will be satisfied. All, all, all these conditions will be satisfied. Um, okay, so this somehow, uh, of course, gives the general idea we want E to consist somehow of exact, in some sense, objects in this functor category. But the problem is, of course, uh, what should it mean? What should it mean? Because usually exactness of a complex is, uh, is defined in terms of, uh, of cohomology. But here, I mean, in this generality, we do not a priori have uh, some good cohomology functions at our disposal. So it's a little bit unclear what exact should mean. So uh, the point is that it, it turns out that you can actually, you can actually talk about or, or at least describe somehow uh, exactness of a complex without reference to cohomology. So let me, uh, <clears throat> let me explain what the point is. So we have a forgetful functor from uh, complexes of A modules to complexes of abelian groups. We simply forget the, the action of the ring A. And uh, now if you have a complex E of A modules, uh, yes, sorry. Was there a question? Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. 
So if you have a complex B here of, of, of A modules, uh, the, the exactness, I mean, the, the exactness of such a complex has nothing to do with the, with the action of the ring. So, so E will be exact as a complex of A modules, if and only if it is exact as a complex of abelian groups. But the point is once you're down here in the category of complexes of abelian groups, it is quite easy to see that a complex will be exact if and only if it has finite projective dimension, if and only if it has finite injective dimension. So this is somehow a nice observation because it, it, it somehow translates uh, exactness in the category up here to a question of having finite homological dimension down here. So you see somehow you get rid of the, uh, you get rid of the cohomology functions, you just, you, you somehow trans, translate the question of exactness into something about homological dimensions which you can define and talk about basically in any category. <clears throat> okay, so by the way, this, this last uh, implication here, or this last uh, by implication here uh, is a rather special property for the, for, the, for the category of complexes of abelian groups. So in, in this category as stated here, uh, a complex and an, an object here will have finite projective dimension if and only if it has finite injective dimension, that special property has a name. It is called locally Gornstein. So, so actually, uh, there's a little bit more to the definition of being locally Gornstein. Um, it, it's a definition uh, proposed by Enox Estrada and Garcia Rosas in a paper from 2008. And it's the definition for an abelian category, may, may, maybe a golden day category, I, I, I don't remember, but you have an abelian category. It is declared to be locally Gornstein if a number of conditions uh, hold. But the most important condition is this, namely that uh, objects have finite projective dimension. They also have finite injective dimension and vice versa. So this is uh, the most important part. So, so here's one example of a locally Gornstein category, complexes of abelian groups. So now we can ask, uh, okay, so maybe, maybe uh, for other choices of pre-additive categories Q, it will be the case that uh, this functor category Q comma set mod would be locally Gornstein. Maybe this is the case. Um, and it is the case. Um, there's a result by Delan Brosho, Stevenson, and Stovicek from 2017, which says, okay, if your pre-additive category Q is Gornstein in the sense uh, described below here, then this uh, abelian category of functors from Q to abelian groups, this would be locally Gornstein in the sense up here. So over here, objects of finite projective dimensions uh, uh, are the same as objects of finite injective dimension, provided that Q is Gornstein. So what does it mean for a pre-additive category to be Gornstein? Uh, it means a number of things. Uh, some of them are rather technical, but somehow are very important. I mean, they're, they're all important, but somehow uh, the most important one I would say is the existence of a SER functor. So Q should have a SER functor. If you want to remember what it means to be Gornstein, remember means to have a SER functor. And I will explain a bit later in the talk what a SER functor is just briefly. And then I will show you what the uh, SER functor uh, does in the various examples I, I talked about in the beginning of the talk. Just to give you a little bit of feeling for what this Gornstein business uh, Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so now we uh, now we take a Gornstein category Q, and now we know that the uh, the category Q comma set mod is locally Gornstein, and then let me go one slide back, and then we use this observation here, which is valid for complexes. Then we use the exact same observation and make it into a definition to define exact objects in Q comma A mod. So this is what we do. So let me go back uh, forward here. Yeah, so here's the definition we propose. So um, take a Gornstein pre-additive category Q. This means that Q has a SER functor basically. Uh, then we know from the theorem of uh, Delan Brosho, uh, Stevenson and Stovicek that this category of functors from Q to abelian groups this category is locally Gornstein, meaning that an object in this category will have finite projective dimension if and only if it has finite injective dimension. So now we simply declare, I mean, we, we, we still have a forgetful functor uh, from Q comma A mod. 
to Q comma Z mod, just forget the A action. So now we simply define an object up here to be exact, quote unquote exact, if and only if it viewed as an object down here has finite homological dimension. And we know by the observation uh, from before that in the case of complexes, this definition of E will recover exactly uh, the exact complexes uh, as we know them. So maybe this is a good definition. Uh, it, it seems at least natural in the case where Q is Gornstein. Uh, but of course the test is point two here. Can we prove that this uh, class E satisfies all these uh, technical conditions which I listed on slide number 14. Uh, and sort of the main result of the paper is uh, yes, with this definition of uh, E, all the required conditions are satisfied. And therefore this functor category Q comma A mod will have a projector model structure. It will have an injector model structure. And in fact, in these two model structures, uh, the weak equivalences are the same. So they have the same homotopy category. And this is, uh, this is somehow the definition of the Q-shaped derived category. It is the homotopy category, the natural homotopy category uh, of, of, of this model category. So you invert the weak equivalences, whatever they are. So of course, to somehow appreciate this, uh, this construction, uh, we have to somehow understand what the weak equivalences are. And let me give you uh, at least the first description of the weak equivalences uh, in this uh, result. So again, Q, Q is Gornstein, the pre-additive category is Gornstein. It is covered uh, by all these examples in the beginning. Um, maybe I don't want to say it anymore, but Q is Gornstein in all the results that follow. Um, so, so now we have a morphism phi in, in Q comma A mod. So this basically means, I mean, this means that X and Y are functors from Q to A modules and phi is a natural transformation. So when is it a weak equivalence in these uh, just constructed uh, model structures? It is a weak equivalence if and only if it has a factorization like this. So X to Z to Y, first a monic followed by an epic. And uh, yeah, let's just focus on condition one here. Uh, the co-kernel of this monic and the kernel of this epic should both belong to E. They should both be trivial objects. Uh, which means that considered, I mean, when you forget the, the, ring, the action of the ring A, they have finite homological dimension. So, so actually there's not much to prove here uh, because all this basically follows from the abstract machinery of, uh, of abelian model categories, which can be found in Harvey's paper. Uh, but nevertheless, it is true. It is a description of the weak equivalences. But somehow it is not a very useful description because uh, given a morphism phi, it is not so easy to, to somehow uh, decide whether or not it will be a given, whether or not it will be a weak equivalence just from this description alone. So, so later in the talk, uh, I will give you uh, somehow a more, a better and clearer uh, description of the weak equivalences, which you can in fact uh, compute and decide um, more easily. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, the Q-shaped derived category has a triangulated structure. It is a triangulated category. It is in fact what people call a uh, an algebraic triangulated category, which means that it is uh, the stable category of, of a Frobenius category. Uh, and this is exactly what this, uh, this result says. So E again is the class of exact objects in this functor category as defined before. Um, yeah, re remember that E left, sorry, remember that E left perpendicular are all the objects in this functor category which are left X orthogonal to everything in E. But it also happens to be the co-fibrant objects in the projector model structure on this category. And this is uh, an extension closed subcategory of uh, this abelian category, therefore it is uh, an exact category. It turns out that this exact category has enough projectives, it has enough injectives, and those two classes of objects coincide. So therefore this is actually a Frobenius category and you can say precisely what the pro-injective objects are. They are precisely the categorically projective objects in the original category. 
and, and, and there's also a dual story here. Maybe I will not mention it. There's also a dual story for the injective monostructure. But the point is that the Q-shaped derived category can now be realized as a stable category of this Frobenius category. And over here, uh, I mean, the, 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 this is known to be triangulated in a very canonical and easily understood way. Uh, details can be found in Hubble's uh, book. So, so, so some of the usefulness of this result is that if you want to compute very explicitly the action of, uh, for example, the shift function, the suspension function on this Q-shaped derived category, you use this model here. And over here, you know exactly how things work. So here's quite easy to, to figure out shifts of objects uh, with respect to the triangulated structure. Okay. Um, yeah, and also, uh, also I should say, I mean, that there's not much to prove here because uh, basically all this follows again from the abstract machinery of abelian model categories. A good reference for this uh, result or a more general version of this result is uh, Gillespie's paper from 2016. So, so in the case of, uh, of, of complexes, I mean, if we specify Q appropriately, then the Q-shaped derived category will be the derived category. And in this case, uh, this stable uh, category will be the homotopic category of semi-projective complexes of A modules. So this equivalence is of course well known, but this is one instance of, of this, just to give you an example. Good, Great. okay. Um, so, uh, so let me get back to this uh, Bornstein assumption. So, so remember, the, the reason I require that the pre-additive category Q is Gornstein is that it makes uh, it possible to define the class E. And once I have the class E, we get the Q-shaped derived category. So maybe I will say a few words about this assumption Q being Gornstein. And as already mentioned, it basically means that Q must have a share functor. So let me give you the definition of a share functor. Um, it goes back to Bondale and Kampranov in a paper from 89. Uh, they, 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 they worked over a field. Here we work over the integers. Uh, but a share functor for pre-additive category Q, this is an auto-equivalence of Q that satisfies this, uh, at first sight, uh, strange-looking natural isomorphism. So let me maybe try to explain why this, uh, how or why this isomorphism uh, comes up in the definition. Uh, one thing you can notice that if you fix P and let Q vary, so you replace Q by a blank maybe, then the left-hand side will be Q or P comma blank. And this is in fact a projective object in this functor category because it is a representable functor. So this is a projective object if you look at the right-hand side, you get uh, somehow what people call the algebraic dual of this co-representable functor, uh, or this, this contravariant representable functor. And this is not so hard to see that in this category Q comma set mod, this will be an object of injective dimension at most one. So you see already this uh, isomorphism here, it gives a connection between in this category between objects of finite projective dimension and objects of finite injective dimension. So somehow this indicates a little bit how you can prove uh, the theorem of the Del Lambrosio and Stevenson and Stovitschek that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so this is, uh, this is why it, it, it looks strange, but really it gives a connection between projective and injective objects in this functor category. So, okay, so let, let's maybe let it make it a little bit more concrete. Let's see how the share functor uh, acts very concretely in the examples I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So if we look at N complexes, uh, what the share functor does in this case is that it shifts uh, N minus one vertices to the right. So if, if P is this vertex here, it goes like one, two, three, four. So N is five in this case, in this picture N is five. This is the action of the of this share functor. So very, very easy to understand. In the case of uh, wide complexes, specifically uh, representations of this repetitive quiver of A4, the action of the share functor is that you go three shifts to the right 
and then you reflect over this line. So for example, if you start with this uh, vertex here, you go like one, two, three, and then the mirror image here is down here. So this P goes to uh, S of P here. And in fact, this entire line here will go to this entire line here. So this is the action of the Seth function in the case of what I call wide complexes. And then finally, if you look at the double quiver uh, of A5, for example, then the, uh, the Seth function is simply a reflection through a line going down the middle of the quiver like this. So, so in this case, uh, the Seth function has a fixed point. This, this middle vertex here is a fixed point for the Seth function. Okay, so this is how it works. Okay, so the final goal of the talk is to, let me see the time. Uh, the final goal of the talk is to define cohomology functors, uh, which are on, on this uh, functor category Q comma A mod. And what I would like them to do is I would like them to generalize the usual cohomology functors we know for complexes. I would also like these cohomology functors to be able to detect uh, exact objects and weak equivalences in an obvious way. So in order to define uh, cohomology functors, uh, I first need to tell you what a stock function is. So for every object uh, Q in your pre-additive category Q, there is a stock functor SQ. So it is a functor from Q to abelian groups. In other words, it is an object in this functor category. And how it is defined? Well, it acts on an object P by returning zero most of the times, except uh, when, when P is equal to Q, then it gives you Z. And of course, if, if Q is just some arbitrary uh, pre-additive category, you cannot define a functor like this. But in, in the setting I am in, with Q is Gorenstein with all that comes with it, it is possible to define a stock functor like this. So in the case, if you think about Q being the uh, path category of some quiver, these stock functors are nothing but stock representations, just means that you place a copy of set at vertex Q and zero everywhere else. So here's a picture of uh, stock functors or stock representations. If you like, you place a copy of the integers at some given vertex Q and everywhere else you put zeros. So these are the stock functors, okay? <clears throat> so once you have these stock functors, you can define some abstract notion of cohomology for an object in your functor category Q comma A mod. So there, there is a cohomology group for every object Q in the pre-additive category and every number I. So H I Q of X will simply be this X group. So you, you take, I mean, remember uh, S of Q is an object uh, in this functor category. So this X is computed in this uh, functor category. So this is what you do. This is, this is the definition of the abstract cohomology of some object X in here. And if you want somehow to explicitly compute these X groups, uh, then of course you need to figure out what a projective resolution of this stock functor looks like. And uh, this is not too bad because basically you know all the projective objects in here, they're all representable functors, maybe some direct sums, maybe some direct summons, but basically you have pretty good control over the projective objects here. So in, in, in specific cases, it is not so bad to write down uh, such a projective resolution and thereby be able to compute these cohomology groups. So let me uh, compute them for you in a couple of examples to see that they are actually uh, quite natural. So uh, let's start with the motivating example of complexes. So here the stock uh, functor will be a stock complex. You have a, you have a copy of, of, of set placed at degree Q and zero everywhere else. So here's a stock complex. And in this case, it is pretty easy to write down a projective resolution in the category of complexes, uh, P0, P1, and so on. There will just be these so-called disk complexes uh, shifted further and further out. And using this projective resolution, you can easily see that if you take this abstract cohomology group H I Q of an ordinary complex X, then you get nothing but the ordinary cohomology of X computed at uh, degree Q plus I. 
So in, the, in, in this case, at least these abstract cohomology groups, they somehow uh, capture or, re or recover the known cohomology, which, which is around. Okay, so let's move up to N complexes. Uh, for an N complex, uh, there are actually several cohomology groups you can associate to a given uh, degree I. These are called the Kapranov cohomology groups of an N complex, let me say what they are. So you go to some degree uh, Xi in your N complex X, and then you fix some number R between zero and N. And what you do is you make yourself a little three term complex like this, where uh, you have N minus R ingoing differentials and R outgoing differentials. So you compose the N minus first differentials going into and you compose the R differentials going out of. And because the differential to the power N is zero, then this would be a good old fashioned uh, three term complex. You can compute the cohomology, the only cohomology there is, a kernel modulo image. And this is the definition of the Kapranov cohomology groups of an N complex X. And what happens is that if you, if you sit down and actually compute these uh, abstractly defined cohomology groups, what do you get? You get nothing but these uh, well-known Kapranov cohomology groups. So also in this case, these abstractly defined groups uh, recover something well-known. What about the case of wide complexes? Uh, so here we have a representation X of the repetitive quiver of A4 satisfying the mesh relations. And what I want to do now is I want to compute uh, the group H1 of Q of X for uh, every vertex Q in this quiver. And the answer depends a little bit on where Q is located. If Q is located here on the uh, upper edge, for example, then it turns out that in order to compute this group, I actually only need to know this part of the representation. I just need to know these three terms of the representation X. Um, and it happens that X satisfy the, uh, the mesh relations. And one of those mesh relations says that this is a three term complex going down up on the upper edge will be zero. So here you actually have a three term complex. There's an obvious cohomology here, kernel beta modular image alpha. And this is exactly what you get from this abstract cohomology group in the case where Q is on the, on the upper edge here. If Q is uh, in the middle of uh, the quiver like here, then it turns out that to compute this guy, you need to know these four terms of the representation X. Uh, and again, by the mesh relations, this square is anti-commutative, which means that you can actually assemble it into a little three-term complex again, like this, this is the three-term complex. So again, you have a natural cohomology associated to this, kernel of this, modular image of this. And this is exactly what you get from this abstract cohomology group. Okay, so, so, so the conclusion is, uh, I hope that, that these abstract cohomology groups, uh, of course you can make the definition, but in very, I mean, in quite a few cases at least, they capture some very real and well-known cohomology which is lying around. So it suggests that uh, it might be a good definition of, 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 a, of an, somehow an abstract cohomology group. So now the question comes, uh, I know I'm almost out of time, uh, are there any good theoretical properties of these uh, abstract cohomology groups? Can we prove some uh, results about them? Um, and yes, the answer is yes, we can. Um, so the abstract cohomology functors uh, H, I, Q, they, uh, they can be used to characterize or detect the exact objects in the following sense. So now X is any object in this functor category, the following conditions are equivalent. So condition one, X is an exact object. So it means that it is weakly equivalent to zero, which again means that it is an object of this uh, class E, which means that when you forget the action of the ring A then as an object in the functor category with values in abelian groups, it will have finite homological dimension. This is what condition one means. It's a little bit uh, weird, but this is what it means. Uh, but this happens if and only if all these abstract cohomology groups vanish. So all Q 
in Q for all positive integers i. And it is actually enough to test this condition two here uh, for i equal to one. If you know that h1 q vanish for every q, then in fact, x will be an exact object. So this is somehow uh, what you would like, what you would expect from, 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 from a bunch of cohomology functions. They should detect, they should somehow discover or detect exactness of objects. Uh, you can also use them to uh, detect uh, weak equivalences. So here, phi is a morphism in this functor category, Q comma A mod. The following conditions are equivalent. Condition one, phi is a weak equivalence in either the projective or the injective model structure we have constructed on, on, on this functor category. Two, uh, every uh, cohomology functor turns this phi into an isomorphism for all Q, for all I. And it is actually enough to check this condition two for I equal to one and two. So if you know that H1 of phi and H2 of phi are isomorphisms for all Q, then you can conclude that phi is a weak equivalence. And if you compare these two uh, theorems, uh, th they look a little bit uh, asymmetrical because up here, you just needed uh, some info coming from H1, but down here you need information coming from both H1 and H2. But in, in general, uh, you, you cannot do without this uh, H2 in, in the case of morphisms. Um, maybe I don't want to go through the counter example. I just want to say, if you, if you, if you remove this condition, uh, conditions uh, one and three are no longer equivalent. So, so the counter example is not complicated. Uh, you can see here, you can find a counter example uh, in the case of representations of the repetitive quiver of A3. Here you have two representations. Um, basically they are zero. You place the copy of set a few places. Uh, there's an obvious uh, morphism from X to Y. It has to be zero uh, most of the time, but here's the identity from this copy of set to this copy of set. And you can prove that H1 is an isomorphism for this phi, uh, for all Q, but phi is actually not a weak equivalence. Yeah, so uh, I think I'm out of time. Maybe I'll skip this result also and just say thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much, Henrik. Can we all unmute ourselves and give Henrik a round of applause, please? Okay, do we have any questions for the speaker? Hi, Henrik. Hi, Jim. Hey. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe it was your example that you're looking at, but are there, um, uh, some sort of conditions where you can detect the weak equivalences with just the one, uh, the first cohomology, um, or do you always need to have the the, the two cohomology as well? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it is it's, very it's, interesting. It's a perfect. Uh, it's it, it, it's a perfect question. Uh, one should think that we had uh, coordinated this because this was actually the the slide that I skipped. But let let me go back to this uh, maybe to answer your question. Let me go back to, to, to complexes because here you can see that, I mean, if you take I to be one, you fix I to be one, but you let Q vary, then clearly even if I is one, but Q varies, you get all the cohomology groups here. So, so I mean, in the case of complexes, you can clearly do with I equal to one alone because yeah. you get whatever cohomology you need by varying Q. Q. So this is, uh, this is, I mean, so so the case of complexes. This is certainly one case where you can uh, where you can uh, do with i equal to one alone in order to detect these weak equivalences, uh, and and somehow there, there there is a kind of general result. Uh, it is uh, here. Um, so yeah. So as I said, in, in in certain situations, like in the case of complexes, you can actually detect weak equivalences just from knowing that H1 is an isomorphism. And uh, yeah, the, the, it's sort of a technical condition. It, it depends on what is called the pseudo radical in this Q. I haven't defined it, but basically in all the examples, I mean, when Q comes 
as the path category of a quiver, it means, this condition means that all path of length two should be zero modulo the relations. So exactly in the case of complexes, the composite of any two, I mean, composable arrows will be zero. Once you are a quiver with this property, then you can always uh, do away with uh, H1. So for the other N complexes for bigger N, does it, um, no, it doesn't hold? Because, I don't think I I don't think so. I I I think already for three complexes you can make a counter example. Okay. So this yeah. is also the point. This is also the point here. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay. So 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 right now I have a picture of two specific uh, representations. But if you imagine uh, the quiver line behind uh, these representations, uh, the composite of two arrows will not be zero in this uh, in this quiver but the composite of three consecutive arrows will be zero. So here the pseudo radical of the arrow ideal uh, cubed will be zero, but not squared. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why you can make a counter example. I, 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 mean, I, I haven't tried it, but I'm almost 100% sure that you can also make a counter example in the case of three complexes. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. There are some, okay, Alex. Uh, Henrik? Hi. Um, hi, that was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you had um, any, if you could, if there's a nice description of the suspension functor on the Q derived category. Like, does it come from the Serre functor on Q, for instance? No. Uh, I mean, uh, this is the case, of course, for, for complexes. For, for, for ordinary complexes, it happens to be the case that. Uh, the Serre functor coincides with the translation functor, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it's, it's somehow like a miracle that those two coincide in the case of complexes. Usually it is not connected. Uh, usually it is not somehow related to the Serre functor. Uh, I mean, as I said, what, one way to do it, uh, what, one way to figure out what it does is by using this, uh, this uh, result by, by Jim. Um, basically you go to this model and here you know how things works. If you wanna say it explicitly uh, here, you can also do this. I mean, basically what you do to, 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 to compute the, uh, the suspension function and the triangulated structure is you start with some object uh, X in this category. So this is a function up here, X is here. And then you make a short exact sequence where, where, where you embed it into a trivial object. So you make a short exact sequence where you embed it into something from E. And then I think this co-kernel will be uh, the suspension of the object you started with. But you can see already- so it's really I mean, just a coincidence then on, on it, the case it, of- it is, it is certainly, a, uh, I mean, e even in cases, even in cases, okay. So, so in the case of complexes, you can shift things around. You can move them around. I mean, so e even in situations where you can move things around, so for example, for n complexes, you can also move an n complex around, you can shift it, you can translate it. Uh, but even in those situations, uh, this is far from uh, the suspension functor in the triangulated structure. So for example, uh, I mean, if you start with a, if you start with a stock, if you start with a stock complex, so now you think of three complexes, for example, you start with a stock complex to compute the suspension in the triangulated structure, you would have to embed it into a, a, a three disc complex or whatever they are called, you would have to embed it into three copies of, so, so, so suppose you, yeah, you have a stock functor on set, you embed it into a disc complex with three copies of set, then you get a co-kernel, then you get two copies of set. So, so if you, so, so you, have, you, you have the stock representation, you have the stock three complex, you can move it around. If you do this, this it will always be a stock three complex concentrated in a single degree. But if you compute the suspension functor, you get a complex concentrated in two degrees. So this is a, I mean, a, a, a priori, these, 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 these two things, the Serre functor and the suspension functor, they are not really related. Uh, although they are, yeah, as, as, as you noticed in, in the case of complexes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that looks. 
Any more questions? So Henrik, maybe there's a, a some sort of natural analog of like a like a contractible complex, uh, maybe, um, and and because and, when you get the suspension by embedding into a contractible complex and take the co kernel, it, it, it might do uh, what what you're looking for there. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I I I, th I think there is a I think there is a version of a contractible complex because there is. Um, uh yeah i i mean uh the disk so 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 so, so typ typical contractible complexes would be these disk complexes everything is built out of every contractible complex is somehow built out of disk complexes direct sums or direct, direct products of these disk complexes so so really what you need is an analog of the disk complex and there is uh, an analog of the disk complex in in this setting Okay. Yeah, so, so, so it is basically, I think, also what you use in your work. So, 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 so you can think of the disk complex of, I mean, as an adjoint of the evaluation at some vertex. Uh, so, so if you look at the left adjoint, you, you, you have such a functor, you can, you can fix a, 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 an object small q in, 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 in capital Q. You can look at the functor that evaluates a functor at a fixed vertex Q that has a left adjoint. This would be your sort of version of a of a contractible, or at least a, a, a basic contractible uh, object in in Q comma A mod. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Can I ask? Can no. I can I ask another yeah, question? Like on this last uh, thing with the contractible complexes, so. Is there something like Q-shaped homotopy category of a ring? Have you thought about this? The homotopy category of the, of, of the ring? What do you say, George? Q-shaped homotopy category. Q-shaped homotopy category. Oh, Q oh sorry. Yeah, yeah Q-shaped. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think there is, but it doesn't uh, somehow come out of this work because, um, I mean, here, uh, I think what what you would have to do, at least what, what, one way to go about it is, is I think as follows, because here, here we fix, uh, I mean, the, the Q-shaped derived category of A modules is somehow constructed from the abelian structure on A modules. So, so, so here in, in this talk, we have viewed uh, A modules as an abelian category. Um, but you could, I mean, so, so, so let me say this. Suppose you had this theory I just talked about uh, where we would be allowed to replace the category of A modules by some exact category. For example, for example, A modules equipped with uh, the split-wise exact structure, which would give you then a degree-wise or object-wise split exact structure here. Uh, then I think, I mean, th then this construction would not be a version of the derived category, then it would be a version of the homotopy category. I mean, because you know, the homotopy category, you can, you can obtain not from the abelian structure of A modules, but by equipping A modules with the exact structure, which would then give you a degree-wise exact structure on the, on the level of complexes, and that homotopy category uh, that model theoretic homotopy category would be the usual homotopy category K. So, so what I'm saying is, uh, yes, sit down and develop uh, in th this theory for A modules replaced by an exact category. Given that you could do this, this would be a framework where some sort of, what you say, homotopy category K would be a special case of that uh, construction. Did, did it make sense? Uh... Yes, yes, it made thanks. Yeah, very good. And with some other comment about this, this construction you do seems like there is always an underlying uh, Gorenstein model, either projective or injective. In this mod Q, it's uh, without the A now, I mean. 
Just yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, 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 so this uh, here, I mean, here in this definition, somehow, yes, somehow we use, I mean, you, you could say that we use, and it is also true, I guess, uh, that, that we use the Jewish Gornstein in order to make this definition. At least it seems like that. Uh, because, I mean, as it, I mean, as it is written here, we use that having finite projective dimension and finite injective dimension is the same down here, which basically requires that the pre-additive category Q is Gornstein. I think maybe it is not necessary. Um, I mean, what we really use is that this class of objects here, I mean, objects, I mean, you, you, you could make the same definition. You could make the same definition, forget Q is Gornstein. Forget, say, the inject to dimension. Just make the exact same definition. An object is called exact if and only if, by definition, it viewed as an object down here has finite projective dimension. You can just make this definition. The question is now, uh, can you prove these conditions up here? Uh, and it depends uh, because I basically what we use is that uh, the objects down here, the objects under consideration down here in this category, is the right half of a co-torsion pair. So in this case, you have the Gornstein projective co-torsion pair. And what I have, uh, what I'm trying to underline here with the mouse, I don't know if you can see it, this is the right half of a co-torsion pair down here. I think this is basically what we use. So I think maybe if you... So it's it's like, a, like pulling back Model it's, structural it's, 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 it's kind of a it's kind of a pulling back or lifting a cotorsion pair down here to a co down here to a cotorsion pair up here. So I think I think that you can do much of this if you replace blah 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 with the right half of a suitable cotorsion pair. Uh, actually, uh, Li Liang uh, sent me. Uh, an email uh, some weeks ago uh, where I think he is doing this or trying to do this. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't found the time to read his uh, his, uh, his notes yet, but uh, somehow I think uh, this is uh, a point. So, so, so in some sense, uh, yes, you can define this more generally. What you probably will not get uh, I mean, here, everything is so symmetrical. So here you get two sort of model structures, uh, the projective and the injective model structure with the same weak equivalences. Probably you will not get this. Um, I'm not sure what the cohomology groups defined via the stock functors. Uh, I mean, Maybe you don't have the cohomology functors uh, if you replace this by something more general. I, I'm not sure. But I think I think the short answer is I think you can do some of this stuff under weaker conditions. Maybe you can even get half of the theory, say uh, the projected part of the theory, from half of the assumptions. The full theory, I'm pretty sure you cannot get. But uh, but I I I I think there's uh, room for improvement. Yes. Okay, thank you. Can we uh, work with Gorenstein schemes here? So, sorry? Can we work with Gorenstein schemes like when you're defining this DQA? Ah, uh, good question. I, I mean, I, I, so, somehow, somehow it feels like you should be able to, I mean, so, so you want to replace uh, AMOD with something else? Is that right? Or? Um, yeah, because the work of Sergio and like, his collaborators, all of those things work perfectly yeah. fine with Bernstein's yeah, yeah. schemes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Somehow, I mean, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, quite a few results in the paper uh, will work. Maybe, maybe there can be a problem when uh, the stock functor part comes up. There can maybe be some problems. I mean, I mean, quite, quite a few of the results, I think, work. It just as they're written, if you replace the category of A modules with any abelian category. Uh, with an exact category, as I mentioned before, uh, maybe, I'm not so sure, maybe, maybe they will. Um, but I think maybe there are some 
There are, there, are, there are some places where you have to be a little bit extra careful at least. I, I don't know. I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't checked it. And, and one other question, how, how good is this uh, Q-shaped react category at detecting like ring theoretic properties? Like if two guys are like Noetherian, um, no, what do I mean? Like if two things, if the Q-shaped react categories of two rings are equivalent as triangular categories, can we say anything about like, yeah, related, like like how the two rings compare. Yeah, to good, other. good, good question. Uh, I I haven't thought about it at all, but it's a, of course it's a very natural question. So somehow, what can you what well, what does it mean to be Q shape derived equivalent or something? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, but it's certainly a natural question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are some comments in the chat. Can you have a look? Okay. Ah. Uh, Except the one by me, and <laughs> but Georgios has asked that question already. Let's see if I go from the top. Uh, the cool Can you see it? Okay, yeah, David. <laughs> yeah, there's a, the last slide, yeah, uh, which maybe is this one, I suppose. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think I think maybe I talked about it. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure when this question came in. Um, and Thomas Utterman asks, can you share the slides? I think you can maybe send them. Yeah, uh, can I send them in the chat maybe? Um, yeah, no, yeah, that, that can be. Let's see, um, I'm doing this. Um, uh, save chat, no. Um, Uh, somehow I don't see a share file symbol. Uh, there is a file symbol. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, it's all right, you can send them to me. Later. Maybe I can send them to you. Yeah, yeah. I will do this. Uh, somehow, I, usually I see a, a file symbol, but I don't see it right now. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, Any other questions, anyone? Okay, um, in that case, let's thank the speaker again. We will have Nico Norman from Regensburg speaking next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having me, and 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 I will send you the slides uh, right away, and you can uh, I don't know uh, you. you